So uh, I want to welcome everyone to this workshop on getting started with uh, COIL. Um, most of you probably know me. I'm Keith Landa, Director of the Teaching Learning Technology Center here at Purchase. Uh, we have a couple of other, co three other co-hosts on the call today. And um, what, uh, actually, let me, let me throw it to the, uh, our co-host right now. Elizabeth, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Everyone, I'm Elizabeth Pearson. Uh, she, her, her pronouns. Um, education abroad coordinator in the Office for Global, newly named Office for Global Education, and we're really excited to be working with Keith and the TLTC um, to bring more coil opportunities and increase awareness around campus um, because there's such a great intersection there of what we're doing and what he does. Yeah. Thanks for being. And then, uh, Crystal, let, let me go ahead to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Crystal Perkins. I teach in the psychology department um, and I coiled and I'll talk more about it. My cultural psychology class back in 2015 or 2016, one of those years. Thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Linda. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Linda Gironda and I'm, a, I'm an attorney by day and an adjunct by night at, uh, at SUNY Purchase and I participated in two COIL courses uh, with Crystal, same time as Crystal, and then I did a global SUNY Commons online uh, class last summer. So uh, I want to welcome everyone again. Um, we're very excited to kind of relaunch COIL at Purchase. Uh, COIL was a lot more prevalent at Purchase in the past. It's kind of uh, um, gone through a little bit of a, a retrenchment, but we want to bring it back up. What I want to do uh, is just start us all off uh, by sharing uh, some slides to just kind of set the framework for what we're talking about um, with uh, COIL courses. And then I want to go to Crystal and Linda to provide uh, the perspective of what it's like to do a COIL course as a uh, faculty then to Elizabeth to uh, set some of the broader framework for um, uh, how COIL fits into the, the broader framework for internationalizing the curriculum and some of the stuff that is coming out of the Office for Global Education. We'll spend a little bit of time just doing some brainstorming about how COIL could be actually um, play a role in your courses. And then I wanna finish it off by presenting some resources and next steps that you can uh, that we can help you with uh, as you um, think about your interest in uh, in uh, developing a coil collaboration so here's the uh, here's the boring slides part um, so that's just basically what I discovered um, and I Actually, I was going to take a look at the chat uh, to see what you all put down in terms of your interests, but in, in terms of just um, expediting things, I'll just go straight here to some of these points. And we'll share the recording and the slides later, so you know, we'll have to worry about it. But uh, personally, I think uh, there's a lot of reasons for, for considering COIL courses. Uh, it's, a, it's a way that we can scale up an inter internationalization experience for our students. Um, not all of our students have the, the time or the means to necessarily do study abroad. Um, and so this kind of virtual exchange can provide the kinds of intercultural and 21st century skills working across cultures that is gonna be so important for so many of our students. Now, hopefully we do, um, we do hope that participating in a COIL experience would um, wet a student's uh, interest in terms of um, you know uh, adding some kind of uh, study abroad in the future um, but anyway this is a way that all all of our programs on campus i think can um, can play a role in internationalizing our curriculum even those that aren't necessarily uh, traditional um, uh, homes for a lot of, of study abroad opportunities so let me just give you in a nutshell what we're talking about with a COIL course. Uh, we basically, this is a collaboration between two 
existing courses or newly designed courses. So we have course number one. For COIL, we're typically talking about a course at one of our SUNY campuses. And we have a course uh, in another country that uh, the faculty for those two courses have come together and decided to do a collaboration. Um, you know, the SUNY course would typically be taught in English. It would be in a variety of disciplines. Uh, the partner course could be anywhere around the world, um, could be, um, you know, certainly non-native English speakers, could be in other disciplines. And the idea is that um, faculty in developing this partnership look for opportunities for students from the two classes to collaborate with each other in ways that enrich and enhance their experience in their individual classes. So this is uh, really kind of a class to class um, relationship. By definition, it has to kind of involve online um, learning tools because it's very difficult for my class here in Purchase to collaborate with students down in Mexico City without our students you know, collaborating online in some way. Um, what COIL is not is necessarily um, so you, know, you don't necessarily think of, um, of COIL as by itself an online course modality. You can certainly take your face-to-face -face course and your partner's <clears throat> course and develop the collaborations. Uh, what COIL is also not is one large international MOOC, for example. Um, it's, you certainly can have an online course that draws students from all over the world. But uh, what's unique about COIL is that your students are coming to the interaction from the perspective of your course, not just from an individual student perspective. And your partner's students are, are doing the same. And so this is an opportunity to really um, uh, use those different perspectives, the different frameworks, the different course content, the different uh, you know, analytical tools that are available in, in the two different courses to really drive a, an enriched kind of collaboration and communication between the students in the two classes. Um, COIL is also not a way for us to recruit online students. Our students sign up for our courses here. They pay for tuition here. They get their grades from the course here. Your partner's students sign up for the course there. They're not signing up for the course here. Your students are not signing up for the course there, uh, and your partner students, uh, your partners, you know, giving grades for their students in their course. So that's in a nutshell what we're talking about with the Coil courses. Um, Coil actually developed first here at Purchase before it moved to the broader SUNY um, administration, and actually came out of experience uh, uh, for. Uh, from a faculty member who had done a, um, a, um, a an abroad, um, a Fulbright uh, trip abroad uh, and wanted to kind of continue to maintain those relationships with his classes, uh, with the classes that he was uh, familiar with over there when he came back from that. Um, so let me just quickly um, run through a cup, a few points about uh, COIL courses. And, and Elizabeth, if you see there's anything in the chat that I'm not paying attention to while I'm showing the slides, you know, just go ahead and break in. You got it. Um, we really want to make sure that this is a reciprocal relationship for the students in both classes and, and also for the faculty. So when you are thinking about um, developing a COIL collaboration, you certainly want to think, well, what am I student? How is this collaboration going to enrich um, the experience for my students? How it's going to enhance what they're getting out of my class? But we also want to think about how can, um, you know, what we're doing in our class, uh, how the activities of our students, how can that enrich the experience for the students in the target class? Um, I will point out 
that you should think about COIL as both uh, a, a, an opportunity for both disciplinary and intercultural enrichment. I mean, the intercultural piece is pretty straightforward. If I've got my students collaborating with students uh, um, who are at Tech de Monterey, for example, and they're working together in, in, in doing team-based projects, and they're working across cultures, clearly there, there's, a whole num there's a whole set of intercultural experiences that they will have to navigate as they work effectively as teams. But I also want you to think about how you can use COIL to do a, a, discipline, a cross disciplinary option as well. Um, you know, a lot of faculty, when they first think about COIL, they have they think, well, I'm, I want to COIL, say, say if I were doing an introductory environmental studies. Um, you know, a very natural perspective would be, oh, I, I need to find an introductory environmental studies course uh, at Tech de Monterey, for example, and then, um, you know, uh, I can have my introductory environmental studies students collaborate with uh, their introductory environmental studies students will be looking at environmental studies issues, but they're gonna be looking at what's the situation down in Mexico and my students are gonna be looking at what's the situation here in New York and, and we can share those uh, those, those different cultural perspectives, different landscape perspectives. But uh, some of the most um, exciting collaborations I've helped facilitate in the past have been across discipline. So for that hypothetical introductory environmental studies course, maybe I look for an introduction, introduction to sociology course at Tech de Monterey. And then we design um, team-based projects around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, where students from my class are bringing environmental perspectives to the projects, and students from my partner's class are bringing uh, soci uh, social and so uh, sociological perspectives to the discipline. Um, so you. I just want to encourage you to think broadly about the kinds of collaborations you might uh, consider. Um, typically, there is some kind of project focus, which provides a great opportunity to involve your students, uh, engage your students in these kind of real world applied learning experiences that really help to, uh, uh, you know, keep them focused on the class and, and enrich the class for them. These collaborations can be as short as, you know, you, you are both gonna devote one module or one unit of your course to the collaboration, or in some cases, faculty decide that they're going to partner their whole course. And so from the beginning to the end of the course, the students are working together. Um, don't want to go in too much depth in some of these, but, um, there's also opportunities for using synchronous versus asynchronous options for these collaborations. You don't necessarily have to make sure that your students, your, your class and your partner's class are meeting at the same time and have a live class together. You can do a lot of asynchronous collaboration between the courses, online discussion forums, uh, and, and other sorts of uh, asynchronous tools. And then when the students are working in their teams, you know, maybe you leave it up to them to figure out how are they going to manage, um, you know, real-time meetings. Uh, do, does everyone have, does everyone want to jump on Zoom or FaceTime or Google Hangouts? Uh, how are they going to to manage their collaboration? Um, so, you know, if you are interested in developing a coil course over time. Um, there are all sorts of issues about languages, different semester calendars, institutional cultures, what technologies to use and so forth. Those are all issues that you know, we would uh, help you work through. Um, but for now, the idea is just to kind of um, you know, throw open the possibilities. Not only do we have the kind of coil class to class um, collaboration that I mentioned, but you know, sometimes there is opportunity for some or, or all of the students to do some travel uh, associated with the COIL.
course. Uh, and, you know, that's not anything that's necessarily built in. Uh, Linda's already mentioned the uh, global commons um, that we did last year for virtual study abroad. That was a little bit different in that classes here at SUNY were partnered up not with classes uh, um, uh, overseas, but were partnered up with uh, community-based organizations in other countries to do projects. So there are lots of different models. Um, just quickly, you probably need to devote more than just uh, um, a meeting some week to, to do this. Uh, if you're gonna have your students collaborate effectively with students from another class, you gotta think about developing some kind of uh, shared culture. Typically you'd have some kind of icebreaker activity. There would be some, some background work that the students would be doing in the two classes, some project they're collaborating on. And ideally, we would want students to reflect on these experiences since they are, um, they do have potential to be very high impact kinds of experiences. Uh, I think I'll, I'll gloss over this, but basically, you know, we're looking at how the two courses can collaborate on specific um, projects that you and your partner faculty design in, in such a way that it enhances what your partner faculty needs their class to do and what you need your class to do. Just to kind of make this a little bit more real, um, here are some examples of past collaborations. Uh, for example, a health and aging course at SUNY Brockport teamed up with the American University of Technology in Lebanon, a technology and society course to do a COIL project on the influence of technology on fitness and aging. Now, fitness and aging is probably not a, a direct learning outcome for the technology and society class. And technology per se might not be a direct uh, learning outcome for the health and aging class, but it was a great way to bring the two classes together. Same thing history at Delhi and international and comparative education at, at uh, American University of Cairo, coming up with a project on multicultural contributions to the evolution of the scientific method. And this last one, um, I, actually, I actually cribbed this slide from a presentation that was done at the SUNY conference on instruction and technology a few years back. And I didn't notice until after I'd, I cribbed the slide out that the third example was, um, uh, a psychology course at SUNY Purchase, uh, um, collaborating with financial engineering at University of Sonora. And not necessarily the most, um, uh, the kind of partnership that would necessarily come to mind to begin with, but looking at cross-cultural definitions of personhood and how they may influence consumer economic behavior. I've helped facilitate a course where there was a chemistry class at SUNY. It was, no, a chemistry class at, um, I think, Tech de Monterey was working with a dance class at one of the SUNY campuses, and they did a successful COIL collaboration there. Um, so with that, um, let me go ahead and stop sharing. And Chris, so you can see why I, <laughs> I thought it might be good to, to uh, pitch it to you next to talk about your experience, given you know, what was on that last slide. Yes, thank you, because that was my class. <laughs> um, just as a review, my name is Crystal Perkins. I'm an associate professor in the psychology department. Um, I actually just looked it up. So um, the training for COIL was fall 2016, and the actual class was spring 2017. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the class, the training, which I think, well, I know looks different now um, because of funding and then because of COVID. And then I actually want to show you the Moodle page and kind of show you how seemingly sort of disparate disciplines we found a way to come together in some way. Um, so, I remember actually um, fall 2016, it was maybe a week or two before classes were starting. And most of the time faculty have their courses prepped or nearly prepped by a week before class. 
And I remember seeing an email from Keith about COIL and I was scheduled to teach cross-cultural psychology. I taught it before, so it was really in a good place. And I see this email from Keith and I said, I have to do this. <laughs> I have to do this, even though it means that I'm going to have to redesign um, uh, a course that was already, I felt personally in a good place. It just seemed like uh, a natural extension to many of the sort of goals and objectives to my cross-cultural psychology class. So let me just speak to, and I'm teaching this class right now, speak to two objectives that the COIL partnership um, really allowed myself and the students and my partnership to really, and my partnership to really dig deep on. So one goal of the class um, is for myself and the students to sort of unpack the cultural foundations of psychological experience. So what I mean by that is the extent to which psychological experience um, is not sort of natural. And by natural, I mean that um, biology doesn't explain it or certain physiological processes don't, don't explain it. And then furthermore, students often sort of interpret psychological phenomenon from an individualistic framework. Or maybe if they were to sort of broaden a little bit to something about socialization or upbringing. So one of the sort of pati particular goals of my course was for students to understand that patterns of psychological experience aren't natural, but instead are patterns of particular um, constructions of reality, particular, in particular cultural constructions of reality. So one of the main components of this course was to make visible, visible the cultural context of experience, not just also for sort of ex what I call exotic patterns over there, right, in other countries, but then also familiar patterns that we observe in our own cultural world. A second goal, um, and this is, a, this is a tough one for students, is to um, discuss uh, Western, particularly the United States and Europe's imposition of knowledge and consider the consequences of that imposition in terms of um, um, epistemological violence. And what I mean by that is omitting conceptions of other people, again, other people meaning being outside of the United States or Europe and interpreting those patterns of other people as um, different, weird, inferior, less than, so really sort of problematizing um, our sort of knowledge production and being very careful not to sort of impose our constructions of knowledge onto other people and other cultural settings um, and not see that other knowledge as sort of less than. I think I, did I um, miss something? Oh, thank you, Melissa. <laughs> um, and then another sort of major component of the class that sort of gets at these two major goals is immersion, cultural immersion. So one of the pro projects that I have in that class is cultural immersion. So I just thought, um, and I've, I'm always thinking about ways each semester about how I could sort of get students close to cultural immersion. And I just thought, that COIL was just a wonderful fit, and it really was. Um, it entailed at the time a significant amount of training. Um, at that time, there was um, two funding sources where um, what was required of myself, and Linda can speak of this also, was first to take part in a I believe it was a six week uh, virtual training. And that was consisted of 
um, sort of learning about sort of your skills in the virtual world and more specifically to find a partner that you would uh, decide that you would agree to coil with. So this training um, consisted of SUNY folks and then depending on what uh, program, actually no, correct me if I'm wrong, the other partnerships um, that, that the other SUNY partnerships. So there was a huge SUNY partnership with uh, Mexico and then uh, North Africa and parts of the Middle East. So I believe professors from all of those locales, we were all um, in the training together and looking for a partner. It was almost a little like speed dating. <laughs> and then after that, um, and unfortunately this is not gonna be able to be done, so I'm hesitant to describe it. We um, then, once we found our partner, we were invited to their university and we would do a university and city tour. And so I partnered with um, a professor from the University of Sonora, which is in Northwestern Mexico, near the US-Mexico border. Uh, I did a univer about a four day university visit. And then all of the SUNY and uh, Mexican professors, we all met in Cuernavaca, Mexico for an additional in-person three to four day training um, and get to know you session. It was, it was uh, really phenomenal, really, really phenomenal. The food was good, everything was, everything was amazing. And then after that, we then had to do an additional maybe six week training where we had to sort of finalize the components of our course. So all, I, I forgot to mention that then we had to sort of continue to sort of develop and streamline what our course would be, what were the points of collaboration. So again, um, we were, there were several models that we could choose from. The model that myself and my partner chose was that we were going to collaborate at certain points, but then also teach our separate classes. So where we could sort of overlap is where we came together alongside teaching the material for our class. I forgot to mention that. But there are different models um, depending on what fits for your partnership. And then the class was launched in spring 2017. And then I just wanna say two other things and then I wanna show you the Moodle page of what we came up with. Um, there was also at the time a Santander, Santander grant um, where I applied for funding that enabled two students from my cross-cultural psychology class to then travel to visit the students at, and at the University of Sonora. And then also we were able to um, uh, have three students from the University of Sonora visit purchase. And then actually, I'm sorry, my faculty partner also came to visit as well. So there was a bunch of beautiful exchanges and then um, exchanges beyond that, where I've heard um, over the years from students that they still uh, keep in touch through uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, anything, questions at this point? Oh. So, so I just maybe want to show you quickly the content, just to show you kind of the places where we merge together, and then I and then I will stop at that point. So let me see. There we go. All right. So here is the Moodle page that we created, and um, I forgot to say one of the somewhat, but we were flexible about this requirement for the University of Sonora students. And most, actually most students at the University of Sonora um, have uh, some background in English, but it does vary. But one of the things that you'll see down here is that everything was in English and in Spanish. Okay, so 
Um, I would encourage, um, even if the students do speak English, just to um, show respect and they, you know, they love this, um, to have it translated in uh, the languages that uh, both countries speak. So this here is sort of the overview, was the overview for the students of what we were going to, places that we were gonna collaborate on. And if you can see, we divided our collaboration across three units. So notice that we didn't sort of just have the students go and collaborate, but we sort of scaffolded up to that. So the first unit was just welcoming and learning about the collaboration, but not necessarily having the students do any direct work at this point. The knowledge construction unit where we were uh, engaging in cultural difference and being uh, aware of our blind spots and um, encouraging cultural sensitivity. And one of the things that um, came up a lot during our training was the sensitivity around language. Um, the training that Linda and I took part in, unfortunately, was in English. And um, this put the SUNY folks at an advantage over the uh, Mexican professors and then also the professors in the Middle East and North Africa. So one of the things, um, and my actual my partner himself also um, was very nervous about speaking English. So our knowledge construction uh, unit was really sort of based around um, acceptance of language and acceptance of sort of where people are in their language um, acquisition. And then the collaboration unit came where the students were sort of doing the, the topic work. So I'm just gonna go slide down and then show you a, a bit more details about each unit. But again, in Spanish. Um, and then one of the wonderful things about purchase is that oftentimes you'll have students that speak multiple languages. Um, so in my cross-cultural psychology class, I have four or five students that spoke Spanish. So if there was any difficulty with the University of Sonora student, and I speak very bad English, uh, Spanish, um, they were very helpful and translated for me. Okay, so the, the information exchange unit, everyone had to create a video, <laughs> myself included, to introduce themselves and then talk about a place that they, show a place that they frequent the most. The most. And this was actually really fun um, to see and the students love this, okay? After that unit, and then there was um, some other small little activities was the knowledge construction unit. And again, this was largely based around language sensitivity. Um, in particular, particular, both classes, um, were asked to listen to um, various videos of people speaking English, that uh, English was not their native language, and I believe vice versa, okay? And um, write down the words that they recognized. And more specifically, what we wanted students to get at is to think about how it is to sort of speak a language that's not native to yours, and what would you sort of do differently if you were interacting with someone that, uh, what were their native language was in English or Spanish. So that was what the sort of discussion component was about. Okay, and again in Spanish, and now the knowledge, um, uh, let me do, so, and also embedded in there were synchronous sessions, which I remember, Keith helping very much with these. <laughs> okay, so now the knowledge construction unit, there were two projects that students had to do that was related to the course material. So the first project was about cultural sensitivity. The other one was specific to the material in the class. So first project was to create an advertisement 
that would appeal to an American and a Mexican consumer based on, for my cross-cultural psychology students, based on the knowledge that they are learning about cross-cultural psychology and the knowledge that the um, economic students were learning. The other option that they could choose, and um, just to remind you, this was at the beginning of the Trump administration. So there were, um, um, so this sort of project was really important in terms of engagement across cultural worlds. So identifying, so the project was for students to identify an issue that was economic an issue that the United States and Mexico disagree on. And again, there were um, a number that the students could choose from. Um, they were to describe what, what the agreement was and then using what each class, what, what each student learned in their successive classes ways to transform areas of disagreement into constructive engagement. And they were to uh, create a presentation no matter which one they chose. And then they had to also build a Facebook page around cultural understanding. Um, so that was really the course. Um, Got a lot of technical help from Keith, because <laughs> um, at that time, uh, it was a bit more challenging to do synchronous sessions. I believe across the semester, we had four synchronous sessions, and then there was uh, asynchronous work throughout the semester. Um, and I encourage uh, whoever's going to do COIL, to not sort of go directly to the topic or the project that you want students to work on, but do some engagement and relationship building first. So I've talked too much, so I'm gonna stop now. Yeah, that's great, Crystal. Uh, Linda, why don't you go ahead? And um, I've got some modifications for the rest of the agenda later. That was great, Crystal. And I second everything Crystal said. It was a really a fabulous experience. I have a, um, I think this is the chart that I have. Let me see if I can share this. Um, this is part of, let me move that into a slideshow. Bear with me a second here. Move that over. Slideshow, play from the start. So this is, um, I went back into my uh, Moodle to take a look uh, at from uh, 2017. Um, and it is exactly as Crystal said, it was in August, I got the email on an August night and I said, gee, this sounds fabulous. And uh, I, I would love to do it and what a great experience. And then the speed dating, we sort of lived in this coil universe where you were truly like speed dating and, and you, you'd you make an offer to somebody that say, nope, I'm, I'm taken. And then you'd have to move on to the next person. So I partnered with an individual by the name of Cesar at a, a Morelia, Mexico. Um, and it was a fabulous experience, not only for the students, but for the uh, instructors as well. And and there are I have a lasting relationship with Cesar. We still uh, WhatsApp with each other. It was a great experience. And, and Keith was a huge help. Keith actually, we traveled together. Uh, we went to Caesar's home, we met his family, we went sightseeing, um, and then Caesar came and stayed at my home. I mean, I've been teaching a long time and I haven't uh, really had dinner with other professors or certainly not slept at their home. And so the level where, you know, Caesar met my family and my children and my mother-in-law and I met his family, it was really a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, so I'm gonna take you through this quickly. Um, this was actually in April 17th and uh, Crystal, Crystal's, um, folks from Mexico attended my class that night. And Crystal and I, and actually with our guests and our families, we went to Patsy's Pizza in the city. And you know, it was just really a remarkable experience. So this is the agenda of that night when Caesar came to visit me and the students were to do their joint presentations. Um, uh, my classes were all asynchronous. Um, uh, Caesar's class is met during the day, my class is met at night, so there was no opportunity for any synchronous activity. An interesting note though, is sort of the power that the, the uh, professors in Mexico had over their students. My students, 
I mean, class on Thursday night. And if I told them they had to show up on a Tuesday afternoon, they wouldn't listen to me. Whereas in Mexico, if the professor said, you know, this is the class date, but you have to show up on another date, they will all be there. So the, the level of, of respect that the teachers have in Mexico is different than what we have here in the US. So this is the agenda. This just talks about what COIL is and you've heard about that. So this was our class. Um, as an attorney, I was looking for some sort of a legal perspective and I met up with Caesar and he was, he's a biology. Uh, professor. And so together we talked about, and this was in Cuernavaca where we spent that time. We already knew who our partner was. We had done some upfront work. And then in the three day workshop, um, it was how do we build the class that we want to create? How do we create our student learning objectives? How do we put some framework around it? And it was really a lot of brainstorming. And, and uh, uh, Caesar and I went through a lot of topics. He wanted to do like genome, genetic stuff and I had no interest in that. And uh, and so, and I was teaching a regular, I, I just didn't feel that I knew enough about it. And looking back on it, the less you know is fine because it's the collaboration that makes it so wonderful. So we landed on the topic of right to die and euthanasia. The course that I was teaching was a law, order and disobedience course. And so my students had a whole set of topic on that. Um, he was teaching a biology course and the overlap was bioethics. Um, we had uh, three student learning objectives that we created down in Cuernavaca. And then um, as Crystal said during, so that was in the fall and between the end of, uh, from November until January, we really had to flesh that out and create a combined syllabus. Um, so our student learning objectives were stu for students to have a new perspective about the importance of intercultural education and bioethics. Um, we wanted students to be more inspired to speak in, uh, to seek intercultural opportunities, and we wanted the students to work in international groups in order to challenge their perceptions and their assumptions and stereotypes and then for them to reflect on their experiences. Um, this is sort of a picture, uh, you know, it shows the level of complexity that uh, existed throughout this. So, you know, I had 30 students I taught at night. I was teaching a law course. He had 12 students he taught during the day and he had a biology curriculum that he had to cover as well. Um, it's about one third of the class at a minimum, I think you need to dedicate. Some students do more, but it is an, at a minimum one third of your class. My students, by the way, one of the interesting things when I first started that, you know, the first night of class, and I said, by the way, this is a COIL class. We will be working with students in Mexico. We'll be doing uh, collaborative team projects. And I had a couple of students that said, you know, that's not what I signed up for. Nobody told me about this and that's not what I want to do. So there was some resistance in the beginning. And I have to tell you, one of my students came around completely. He, he was the most vocal opponent of it. And by the end of the semester, he invited Caesar and Crystal's guests. He was a he worked for the Greenberg Police Department. He was a te detective for the Greenberg Police Department. Uh, and he took them to the police department. He took them to visit the judge of the town of Greenberg. And then he brought them to their home for dinner. And I picked them up that night. And it was just to watch this student evolve from not wanting to do it on day one, uh, you know, completely resistant to really embracing this opportunity and, and making a difference. So um, I, now we chose Edmodo, we used WhatsApp. And in fact, that was the first time I'd ever used WhatsApp. And it was so dynamic. The students were communicating with each other and WhatsApp and my phone was going off all the time. It was terrific. I now still use WhatsApp in all of my classes as a result of this. Um, and we selected Edmodo as the, uh, the choice of uh, technology it was not my first choice. I would have preferred uh, Facebook. And in fact, it was a conversation with Keith that said, you know, Edmodo was some, it's very much like Facebook, but it's a, a closed system and it had immediate translation. And Keith said, you know, you know, because this is in English, maybe the give and take is you go with the Edmodo system, which was their um, technology system of choice. And so that was, it was really a give and take. Um, so we, very similar to uh, what uh, Crystal had, you know, sort of the framework, we started with an introductory icebreaker video. Um, and then we took a look, the film was really just sort of um, uh, some groundwork in right to die and euthanasia. And we watched how to die in Oregon and we had to do an Edmodo reflection. And I will tell you that if I had to, I was a little concerned about how much time this was taking and the other content I had to cover. Looking back on it now, and if I were to do it again, I would let the COIL class um, take up as much room as it needed. So for example, there was another film called The Sea Inside, which is all in Spanish with English subtitles. And there was some discussion of whether or not I would have my students watch that. And, and we didn't because of time, but if I had to do it again, I would do that to even it out for a film in English and a film in Spanish. And then we divided the students into six cross-cultural teams on different topics about right to die. And they were legal, religious, 
government um, uh, legislation, cultural, and we put them into the teams. We did create a COIL shared syllabus. And so you see the gray part in there is exactly what um, the areas that we plan to meet and the work that had to be done. Um, and it was a joint syllabus that both of us put together. Um, so for example, this, these were the groups that we had, legal, medical, religious, ethical, and moral, uh, government policy, policy and legislation, and international. And they had to do a number of critical reflections associated with it. And they had to do a PowerPoint presentation that had a framework of what's the context, what's the content, what's the conduct, and what's the US uh, versus Mexico comparison. Um, so these were the teams. My students, in addition to this, from a law and order standpoint, um, I had them look at landmark Supreme Court cases associated with right to die. So that's how I uh, brought that into, tied it into the rest of my class. And again, I would tell you that it's not as important to tie it into the rest of the class, let, to let it live its own life, um, because the students learned so much. We had a pizza and then a reflection, and I think this is, this is just the end of it. So it was... Um, it was really a wonderful, wonderful experience. And the students in their final reflection, it, I'm gonna to stop to share here. Um, it was really amazing, uh, the experience that the students had. So, and I would do it again, if I could. That's great, Linda. Um, you know, Elizabeth and I, th I think we're gonna call a little audible here. I had a, a, a brainstorming activity, which I, I, I think might be kind of premature. I think the most important thing we can do in the time remaining is to open it up to allow everyone to ask uh, questions of the faculty, because I think that faculty perspective is probably the most important thing to come out of the workshop here. Um, when we follow up with all of you to send out a follow-up email with a link to the recording and so forth, I think we can just link out to some of the resources, the websites that we were planning to, um, to show as next steps. And uh, certainly, if there's an interest in additional follow on workshops, we can do that, but we can also Elizabeth and I can can uh, arrange one on one consultations as well if you if you're interested in in what are the next steps in setting up faculty profiles and so forth. So with that. Um, you know why don't we take the next five minutes uh, anyone who wants to just you know. Um, Turn on your microphone, uh, ask whatever questions you might want to ask of, of Linda. Uh, Laura, I see your hands up. Um, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your information. And it sounded really engaging and fascinating. And I just, you know, I can't wait for the, the possibility of going somewhere and meeting interesting people again uh, and thinking about interesting collaborations. Uh, my question is, uh, how does this count toward full-time faculty's uh, teaching requirements? Is it partial? Is it is it full? Um, it, it's it's uh, unclear where this falls into one's teaching expectations for the year. So I'll go ahead and take that one um, since it's more of kind of an administrative course. I mean. Uh, Laura, you would just be teaching the course you would normally be slotted to teach. So instead of, you know, assigning a project for that course that involves students doing some kind of research, the project would involve this intercultural piece instead. So it's not like you're, you know, it's not like you're teaching a different course. Well, your course would be modified, but it would be the course, I, it, uh, Crystal's our course that she did, the cross-cultural psychology, was the course that she would have taught in her normal rotation, and so would have just counted it toward her um, appointment as, as normal. Okay. It's, it's not that you're like splitting the course in half among two professors. You're doing, you're teaching your own course and then coming together in places that you sort of both agree on. Great. And um, I have a, another question. Is it discouraged or does it really not matter to teach with somebody uh, in a cross-cultural context, but uh, with somebody who teaches your same discipline? For example, years ago, um, before COIL went into its temporary dormancy, I thought that it would be really cool to, to team up with a British academic and teach the American Revolution on both sides of the Atlantic. 
Uh, is that, does that kind of defeat the purpose of what coil should ideally be, or is that within the range of, of possibility? Uh, I'll jump in again. Again, that, that's certainly within the range of possibility. So, uh, you know, it's really whatever makes sense as an enrichment for your course and an enrichment for your partner's course. You, you shouldn't feel like you, you need to be constrained. Like if I'm teaching environmental studies, I don't, I shouldn't feel like I'm constrained to find an environmental studies course to partner with because sometimes the partnerships across disciplines are very exciting, but there is no reason why you can't look within the discipline as well. Yeah, and I would second that uh, because I really wanted to find, I wanted to do a legal comparison. That's what I was interested in. Um, and, and they really encourage you to sort of go outside. So you can do that, but to go outside of your discipline because that's where the exciting and different things happen. I, you know, I talked to one individual um, and she taught Asian art and she partnered with a, a school in Mexico that was teaching hospitality. And together the students designed uh, restaurants with an Asian theme and what food they would serve in the service. And it was, it was a fabulous project on both sides. Cool. So the possibilities are endless. <laughs> Thanks. I, I will share, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of extra work and, and sort of the, ca the carrot for us was a trip to Cuernavaca, Mexico and to visit those other schools and and that you know there was no additional compensation there's no stipend for it um but but it was worth it it was a lot of work but it was worth it i've always been attracted to it since i've uh known that it existed and um I, i'm just sitting here thinking well if not to historians what other interesting possibilities are out there to explore i like the speed dating analogy where you can really think like hmm okay, this dimension could fit in with this discipline somewhere along the line. It's lots of cool possibilities. I mean, um, just to give you another example, uh, Laura, Wayne Tabrock? Yes, yeah. I mean, Wayne was really the person who encouraged me to right. consider it. And you know, his colleague was, um, I mean, his colleague from Turkey was in a re history related field as well. So there, you know, they were bringing different uh, perspectives on the discipline together in their collaboration, as well as the cross-cultural. But it was not, you know, this, it was not this chemistry and dance kind of collaboration. Um, <laughs> so anything from two exact courses of the same, just looking at different perspectives from the different countries to wildly different cross-cultural, cross-disciplinary cross collaborations, they can all work. Great, thanks. Keith, I was gonna say the next, uh, the, that can be our follow-up, Laura, and for those of you too who might feel like you're ready for that, we, we were gonna talk about the Immerse You page, which is where we're bringing faculty profiles to make those connections. Um, so I can, right, Keith, that'll, that'll be our follow-up. So the next step is actually finding those partners. If you don't have um, you know, a connection in mind, you can start exploring what other faculty around the world um, are available and what they're teaching. Um, so in, in our follow-up um, message that will go out after the workshop, we'll include a link to the uh, Coil It Purchase page that Elizabeth put onto the uh, OGE website. Um, we'll have links to the Coil, um, the SUNY Coil Center website, which kind of lays out what the current list of uh, professional development is will include a link to the global partner network. One, one advantage that we have being part of the broader SUNY COIL network is that uh, the COIL Center has developed all these relationships with uh, institutions around the globe for these kinds of collaborations. Certainly we can draw on the kinds of uh, partnerships that Office of, of Global Education, Office for Global Education, sorry, um, already has. And so we can, we can leverage those but we can also leverage, uh, you know, the membership in SUNY Coil Network and the global partners as a way to find uh, potential partners. And as Elizabeth said, part of that uh, SUNY Global Network is there's a new partnering website that's been set up. And uh, anyone who's interested, we can get you set up with a faculty profile on that 
uh, partnering site where you can say, hi, here I am. Uh, I'm in this discipline. These are the kinds of courses I teach. Here are the kinds of collaborations I'm interested in. And, uh, you know, that's a way to kind of advertise your, your interest in doing this. But also that partnering site provides an opportunity to, you know, search for, well, who, who do we have in, in, uh, in South Africa? Uh, you know, what are the faculty at, uh, at Durban who have, um, you know, put their profiles on, what kind of partnerships are they looking for? Is there someone I can find a partner there? So there are some, some clear next steps that we can follow up on. Great. Um, I just have a question that, because I know it's different now, what does the training look like? So as sort of Linda said, it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, so, and our training was sort of in three, uh, three different sort of time spans. Yeah. Well, and so what does it look like now? So it is, uh, it is somewhat streamlined. Um, I, will take, I will take one minute to um, go to coil.suny.edu and um, there are some other resources off of here that I'll point to in the email that comes uh, out to follow up this, but under professional development, there's essentially a uh, three week workshop on what are the foundations of doing a COIL um, course. This, you don't have to have a partner for this. <clears throat> this is basically walks you through some of the logistical and pedagogical kind of considerations that you would need to think about. Uh, and then once you do identify a partner, there's again a three week coil design uh, workshop that you and your partner can sign up for where um, staff from the coil center help to facilitate um, your working through the process of co-developing this collaboration piece. So, um, I mean, that's uh, maybe in some respects a lot more streamlined. Obviously, those are all virtual classes. There's, there's not the opportunity for travel until some additional State Department money comes along. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it is a pretty effective way for you to kind of get your understanding of what COIL is. And then once you have a partner to you know, have a facilitated um, co-development process for your collaboration. And as members of the COIL network, we have um, a certain number of slots that we've already um, have allocated to us each year, each year for faculty to go through that training. If we max out the number of slots that we have allocated to us, we can certainly purchase additional uh, slots. If you already have a partner in mind that's not part of the SUNY Global Network, um, certainly I've had enough experience helping faculty to develop COIL kinds of collaborations that we can also handle this in-house. So, you know, if you already know that you've got a colleague over in Norway that the two of you want to develop a course, uh, if they've got instructional designers on their end and we've got instructional design support on our end, we can, you know, do this, this kind of uh, facilitation um, just um, so we're already over time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, for coming this afternoon. Um, thank you. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. A, a really quick question. Um, I have a colleague in the Czech Republic. The problem is uh, that he doesn't speak English very well. The idea was either to have translator or used me to be able to go between both languages. With the training, I'm simply curious how that would work. Um, it is a technique, uh, both parties are interested. They are teaching it, I am teaching it. I thought maybe we can share the ways how we're going about it and the students can benefit from it. Of course, we are not 100% happy because it's an acting program and we like to be live, right? So with the zooming and the technology and time difference and language, I'm just wondering if you are suggesting it or not. 
Well, I would say, like, the thing is, you don't need to go on the resources of the Global Partner Network, that maybe uh, Elizabeth and I just uh, have a meeting with you and your colleague, and we can discuss what some of the op opportunities are. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, any last uh, points? No, I just hope that you'll reach out. We're available. Um, we're so excited about getting a new cohort um, of faculty on campus. And so please, please reach out and we're here to support you. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>